Well, greetings, everyone. I'm Christina Marinakis, and I'm one of the directors of Jury Research at Litigation Insights. We're proud to be presenting today on the issue of gender and diversity in the courtroom. By the number of attendees we have today, I can tell this is an important topic for many, and it's an important topic for us too. We've had the honor of working with some tremendously talented and gracious female attorneys over the years. In fact, some of our greatest trial wins in the last year were, were with female attorneys in the first chair. I think most of us are seeing greater opportunities for females within the legal profession, which begs the question, does gender bias still exist? Dr. Katrina Cook will be discussing some of the research in this area and will provide practical tips for connecting with juries that I think will apply to all attorneys, regardless of gender. Dr. Cook has 11 years of practical application, study, and research in legal communication, jury consulting, and jury psychology. She's designed and conducted mock trials and experimental studies, assessing the factors that influence juror judgments. As part of this research, she's examined how female attorneys are viewed by jurors, how certain factors can interact with gender to affect juror perceptions, and how female attorneys can mitigate the challenges they face. Katrina's work conducting focus groups and performing statistical analyses on our data has made her a valuable asset to our jury research team. Katrina, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you very much, Dr. Marinakis. Hello, everyone. I hope you and your families are staying safe and well. Today, as Christina said, we're going to talk about gender bias in the courtroom, including how jurors perceive female attorneys. And so that you all can see the slides, I'm going to go ahead and turn off my web camera. Before we get into the meat of our presentation, I wanted to give a brief introduction to our firm and some of the services we offer. Litigation Insights is a full service litigation consulting firm offering jury research, such as mock trials and large scale surveys, along with jury selection support in the form of voir dire preparation, in court assistance, and internet research of potential jurors. Additionally, our graphics and animation division and trial technology divisions offer assistance with graphics and demonstrative development, video deposition editing, and in-court technology support. Today, we're going to talk about perceptions of female attorneys, how we can combat gender bias, as well as the importance of diversity. Moving on to our main topic, today we're going to be talking about gender bias in the courtroom. Specifically, we were interested in how jurors perceive female attorneys. In order to figure that out, we set out to answer the following research questions. Number one, how do jurors perceive female attorneys? Number two, are jurors' own genders related to how they perceive attorneys? Number three, how do female attorneys stack up against male attorneys in the courtroom? Number four, does an attorney's presentation style matter? And finally, number five, what do jurors have to say about female attorneys? In order to answer these questions, we conducted two phases of research. In the first phase, we conducted a survey asking jurors about their perceptions of female attorneys. We collected this data from 2013 to 2016. Over the course of this study, we collected data from 1,248 participants. Now, all of these respondents were jury eligible citizens. Specifically, these were surrogate jurors who participated in mock trials. If you're familiar with statistics, we used a stratified sampling technique, which matches the demographics of our sample to the trial jurisdiction. As part of this questionnaire, we asked a variety of questions of jurors about how they perceived female attorneys. And I wanna go through a few of the questions we asked so we can get a flavor for what these surrogate jurors think. First, we asked jurors to agree or disagree with the following statement. If I needed a lawyer, the gender of the lawyer would matter to me. As you can see from the graph, 77% of people disagreed that gender would matter to them, which is very encouraging. But there are still around 23% that agree that the gender of their attorney matters. So while the majority of people don't take this into account, there is a percentage of the population that still does. Interestingly, breaking this question down by the gender of the juror did not make a difference. So neither male or female jurors were more likely to say that the gender of their attorney mattered. We also asked jurors to agree or disagree with this statement. 
female attorneys are more likely than male attorneys to make a motion part of their case in a trial. Again, a slight majority of jurors disagreed with this statement, but here we can see there is a stronger percentage of jurors that agree that female attorneys are more likely to bring a motion into their case. Now, statistically, there was no significant difference between male and female jurors here. However, when you break the previous question down by race, you get some interesting results. You'll notice the stars by the Hispanic and African-American bars on the graphs. These jurors were more likely to believe female attorneys were more likely to bring a motion into the courtroom. Some of this difference may be due to differing cultural expectations regarding gender. Depending on the culture, women may be expected to be more emotional in public life. Conversely, when you look at the percentage of Asian jurors who agree with this statement, it is much lower. Again, cultural expectations may come into play here, with Asian cultures placing more emphasis on displaying less emotion in public. Next, we ask jurors to agree or disagree with the statement. Female lawyers are more effective than male lawyers in certain types of cases. As you can see from the graph, female jurors were much less likely to believe this than male jurors. This result does actually square with previous research, which has shown that female lawyers may be perceived to be more effective in cases involving family, children, or health issues. Again, gender stereotypes play a role here, but this can also play into your case strategy when selecting your trial team for various cases. So, if you know a certain percentage of the population perceives women to be more effective in certain cases, it may be more helpful to have more women on the trial team. We also asked jurors whether they believed female attorneys need to work harder than male attorneys to succeed in the legal profession. As we can see, a fairly strong percentage of jurors believe female attorneys have to work harder. Now, it may seem a little counterintuitive, but this might actually be a good thing, since it shows that people acknowledge the work that women have to put in to climb the ranks of the law, and they may take this into account when evaluating female attorneys. Finally, we asked jurors whether it bothered them more when a female attorney is aggressive than when a male attorney is aggressive. The good news is, as you can see by the graph, the number of individuals who agree is very low. However, there is still about 24% who agree, even somewhat. You'll notice from the bars on the graph, male versus female, that men are more bothered by it. When it comes to this, aggressiveness doesn't fit into what we perceive as traditional gender roles. So it could be that men are perceiving women violating their gender roles by performing in an aggressive manner. In the second phase of the study to answer our research questions, we conducted post-trial interviews of jurors following real trials. As part of this, we asked jurors to rate the attorneys on various characteristics, including organization, conviction, likability, competence, and honesty. For the purpose of this, only attorneys who gave openings and closings were included. Overall, we collected data from 1,134 jurors from 81 different cases. In the end, jurors viewed 188 male attorneys and 40 female attorneys. And you can see from that split, women are still somewhat underrepresented in participation in significant parts of trials. So as I said, we asked jurors to rate the attorneys on five different characteristics organization, conviction, likability, competence, and honesty. From the graphs, you can see there was not much difference between how jurors rated male and female attorneys. In fact, the aggregate score overall for male and female attorneys across the five categories is pretty similar. This is consistent with previous research that shows that gender tends to be less of an issue in highly skilled jobs, such as doctors or lawyers than it is for lower status jobs, such as construction or sanitation. In other words, the occupation of doctor or lawyer becomes more important to people because of its status than gender does when they evaluate the attorney. It could also point to a disconnect in how much gender bias people think exists versus how much that bias is reflected in reality. In these ratings, individual characteristics of the attorneys, 
not simply their gender, may just be what wins out in the end. And as I said, we conducted post-trial interviews of jurors, so let's look at their own words when they're talking about male and female attorneys. This juror said, maybe because I tend to trust women more than men, I liked her informal style. This other juror says, and the other one, the woman, I liked her too, very believable. I don't know why, but I just believed her. So as you can see from this, while the ratings weren't different when we asked them to evaluate your attorneys on those five characteristics, gender is clearly something that jurors are aware of. And when you look at juror number two, one thing that's interesting is we notice in post-trial interviews that jurors frequently call male attorneys by their name, but rarely call the women attorneys by their name. So as shown by these jurors, regardless of the lack of difference in how they rated them, it's still a characteristics people notice and seem to be aware of their own potential bias regarding gender. And if you have any questions, again, you can submit them on the bottom right of your control panel. And it looks like we have two here already. So Katrina, one of the questions you had asked jurors was whether male or female attorneys were more likely to make a motion part of their case in trial. Do you think jurors perceive it as a bad thing to make a motion part of the case, or is it something they would appreciate? I think that this would depend on the case. Jurors do appreciate a motion. They appreciate you being invested in what you're talking about. But, and we'll talk a little bit later about there being sort of a sweet spot, this can also be pushed too far. So too much emotion, particularly if you're a woman, can be something that jurors penalize you for because they perceive it as being something that detracts from the case. You're putting emotion over the facts of the case. And we see jurors say this a lot when they're doing mock trials. Don't get into a whole bunch of, of emotions. Just tell me the facts of the case so I can evaluate. It looks like you collected data for the study from 2013 to 16. Do you think the same level of gender bias exists today? We've made a ton of progress when it comes to gender bias in the last 10 years in the last 30 years, and it's only getting better. So I do think that the level of gender bias has been going down. We're seeing more women involved in court cases. It's becoming more normalized. And the more normalized something is, the less likely it is to have bias attached to it. However, gender bias, as we'll talk, does still exist to some degree. So it is something that we need to keep an eye on and figure out how we can manage. All right, that's all the questions we have at this point. You can continue. All right, thank you very much. Moving on to the next part of our talk, I would like to talk about other research that has been done by other sources. One study, which consisted of 880 mock jurors, asked jurors to participate in an implicit bias sorting test. For the purpose of this study, jurors were shown a photo of a male or a female attorney and a word that is either positive or negative. They were then asked to sort the words into male and female and positive and negative categories. Now, implicit bias is when someone's sorting speed, how quickly they sort those words, is dependent upon the pairing of one sex with either positive or negative words. For instance, if the person sorts females and negative words faster than they sort males and negative words, there's an implicit bias, negative bias with females. As you can see, the results of this study showed that men preferred men and women preferred women. In the end, women's preference was stronger. Now, this also matches with previous research, which shows that we tend to like people who are more similar to us. So it's not surprising that men will prefer men and women will prefer women because they tend to have more similarity. In this study, jurors were asked to evaluate a two-page opening statement read by either a male or a female attorney, and then rate the speaker on several characteristics on a five-point scale. And you can see here the different characteristics they listed. I'm not going to read them all in the interest of time. Participants viewed the male and female attorneys comparably. Across the difference, this study found significant difference in only four areas. Overall, jurors rated women as more angry, and you can see the scale results there. They rated women as more argumentative, they rated men as more friendly, 
and they rated men as more effective. Within gender, jurors rated their own genders as clearer and more caring. Again, going back to that affiliative thing, we tend to like people who are more like us or who are in the same category as us. Men also rated women as less persuasive. So again, we can see that there are differences in how jurors perceive different uh, jurors of different attorneys of different genders. Now, if you remember our research questions, we were also interested in whether gender interacted with presentation style. One study that looked at this examined whether an aggressive or passive presentation style interacted with the gender of the attorney. Jurors heard audio cross-examinations of the victim and closing arguments. They were then asked to rate the attorneys on the effectiveness scale. And the aggressive style tends to be a more confident speaking style. It has a higher volume, a faster speaking rate. There are fewer hesitations and pauses, while a passive style tends to have a slower rate. There are more hesitations and stumbles. Basically, if you think of a confident speaker versus a non-confident speaker, you have the general idea. As you can see, male attorneys were rated slightly higher in effectiveness than female attorneys, although that result was not statistically significant. However, the aggressive style was rated as significantly more effective than the passive style of presentation. This result is a classic example of what we call the female double bind. What do we mean by double bind? An attorney is expected to be assertive, and as these results show, an aggressive style is viewed as more effective, but women are expected to be more passive based on gender stereotypes. So if a female attorney acts in a way that is perceived as too aggressive, she may be perceived as violating her gender role. But if she acts too passively, she may be thought to be violating her occupational role. This creates a conundrum for women, as either way they can potentially be perceived as acting outside of one of their roles. This creates a balance that each woman has to strike. Essentially, there is a sweet spot that keeps jurors from feeling as though female attorneys are acting outside of their roles. When a female attorney breaks too far outside of that role, too aggressive, too passive, that is when jurors begin to believe she's gone outside her role and may develop negative impressions. Of her. And again, we can see this when jurors talk about female attorneys. This juror says, I didn't like the lady attorney on the defense side. She was very, when she was questioning the plaintiff's witness doctor, she was very aggressive and all her questions were very aggressive. And interestingly, you'll note this juror does not have a very stereotypically feminine presentation style. So even jurors who themselves may not strictly conform to gender stereotypes may show these biases. So they may be present regardless of how you were raised or socialized. Another juror said, I think she could present a little softer face occasionally. She always looked very stern. And you know, as a juror looking over at them, it's like, gosh, does she even enjoy what she's doing? Does she even wanna be here? I know nobody wants to be in a courtroom being sued, but you've got to show a little bit of enjoyment in what you do. So if anybody's ever heard of the resting bee face, I won't say the word, this is an example of a juror feeling as though an attorney was not soft enough in her presentation in court. And we've all heard, you know, women are frequently asked to smile. That's part of the expectations for a gender role. Another juror says, I think she was nice and fine. I felt like sometimes for my taste, she was a little bit over polite. I think they all were, but maybe because she is a female and females are naturally more polite, so she didn't have to go too much further. I felt like politeness got a bit to the point where it was not disingenuous, but formulaic or like a process. Now here we see the flip side of that double bind. This gender feels as though the female attorney has swayed, swayed, strayed away from that sweet spot. You'll notice here he said women are naturally more polite. This shows his expectations for how he thinks women will act. So again, Jurors are at least peripherally aware in some cases of the biases they have and the expectations they have for different roles and different gender. 
Interestingly enough, though, when male and female attorneys were polled asking whether they experienced more gender bias, who they experienced more gender bias from, they reported they experienced more gender bias from colleagues, opposing counsel, and clients than jurors. So this isn't just a matter of managing gender bias from jurors, it can also be a matter of managing gender bias when it comes from other actors in the courtroom. And we can see this reference in pop culture with things like this cartoon. It says, so you went to law school and now you wanna practice law, I think that's sweet. So you may or may not have encountered that, but this is something that pop culture ref recognizes as having happened. So how do you battle this bias? How do you make sure that you're in that sweet spot? Well, there are a few things you can do. And I have to say, many of these recommendations apply to both male and female attorneys. After all, there are many different types of bias, not just gender. So if you're a male attorney, that doesn't mean that these can't be applied to you as well. First, it's important to be yourself. Jurors appreciate when you have a personality. In the end, you're most effective when you're human and relatable. As part of this, it can also be helpful to be remembered for something unique. Interestingly enough, in post-trial interviews, we find jurors often have nicknames for attorneys or running jokes to keep them entertained, such as, ooh, what kind of shoes do you think she'll wear tomorrow? What about that attorney? What tie, color tie will he wear? That juror has the coolest suspenders or the coolest bow ties. Uh, one attorney that I saw had a habit of wearing different types of bow ties, and jurors talked about that. You know, he was the bow tie attorney. Jurors use these things both for a little humor. They're seeing some pretty heavy material some of the time, so it lightens things up. But it also helps them keep all the trial personnel straight. Remember, they're getting a lot of information and a lot of new people. So being remembered for something unique lets them tag you as someone they should pay attention to. You also want to be the most prepared person in the room. If you're highly prepared and deliver a confident performance, jurors are more likely to judge you on that instead of other peripheral characteristics such as gender. So you want to have them focus more on your argument than actually on those peripheral characteristics. And being prepared ensures that you have a good argument that they can follow along with. And as part of that, you want to deliver a confident performance. We obviously pay more attention to speakers who are confident and dynamic. And as part of that, then they're less likely to take gender into account when evaluating you because you are so confident. It's also important to keep your audience in mind. When you move to different areas of the country, things about your presentation and dress need to change. For example, we had one attorney who was presenting in a fairly rural jurisdiction who showed up with a very expensive looking cufflink. That might not be something you would think jurors would notice, but they very much did and noted it when we talked to them. It was something they held against him. You know, he was snobby, he was flashy. So this is something to keep in mind, how you dress needs to change, how you act needs to change. If you're in Los Angeles versus the Midwest, these have differing expectations for what an attorney is going to act like. In Los Angeles, you can be a little more flashy with your dress. In the Midwest, it's obviously a little bit more conservative. Regardless of where you are though, it's important to treat all jurors on the panel equally. They wanna feel as though they're respected. Jurors really dislike it when they perceive themselves as being condescended to by attorneys. They really want to feel as though you're treating them as someone capable of understanding what's going on, even if it's complicated. So regardless of who the juror is, it's important to treat them all the same. Another way you can battle bias is you can try to deselect jurors and voir dire who don't like you. So, if in voir dire, you notice a juror scowling at you, it may be something to keep in mind. However, it's important to make sure the juror is truly reacting to you. So be sure to observe their interactions with opposing counsel and keep in mind that it's hard to tell from body language alone what a juror is thinking. During one case we were assisting on, counsel was sure one of the jurors did not like him because he always had his arms crossed. But in post-trial interviews, the juror gave a very favorable rating to the attorney. 
So you never know. And in the end, it's more important to, it's likely more important to think about biases the juror may have about the case than whether they don't like you. So if there are other biases you've caught during your questioning, those are going to be more important in the long run. Jurors also like it when you are respectful. They want you to rise above provocation. For example, during one of the cases we assisted on, a female attorney was cross-examining an orthopedic surgeon. The surgeon was being very condescending towards the attorney, but the, journey, the attorney pushed on and she didn't rise to the bait. During our post-trial interviews, jurors said how much they appreciated that and how she had never sunk to his level. Finally, as we've discussed, assertive can be seen as being confident and effective. So we want to try to be effective. We want to try to be assertive. But too much aggression can lead jurors to perceive you as being uh, a B, if you want to use the word, it can perceive them, lead them to view you negatively. As part of this, when you are trying to be assertive, it's important to use sarcasm and anger only sparingly and in appropriate circumstances. Not doing this is a very quick way to turn jurors against you. You also want to ignore hostile remarks, either from opposing counsel or from witnesses. Remember, if you've ever heard the saying, it's easier to catch flies with sugar than with vinegar. Same thing here. Being respectful and annoying, ignoring those hostile remarks makes jurors like you. It can also be helpful to use humor, but be careful. Humor can backfire. For example, during one case we helped with, the attorney made a joke during his opening statement that just fell flat with jurors. They thought he was being too flip for the subject matter at hand. So make sure you've practiced the joke to make sure that it isn't something that jurors are going to take the wrong way. Finally, it's really helpful to smile at witnesses. Jurors want you to seem as though you're warm and they also want, don't like the resting bee face we've talked about. So smiling at witnesses is something that can help make you seem more approachable. As part of being assertive, not aggressive, we want to avoid powerless language. This is something that women tend to be socialized to do, so it can be hard to break this habit, but it really does pay off in the long run. So powerless language tends to be uh, categorized by having faulty articulation, having a slower speech rate, a softer voice, having hedges or hesitations, ums, those verbal fillers, stuttering while you're speaking. Powerless speech also has lots of apologies and women tend to be, like I said, socialized towards this. I'm an apologizer. Whenever something goes wrong, I tend to say, oh, I'm sorry, even though that's nothing that I could have done to prevent it. It's something I really have to work to train myself out of just because it's so much of a habit. Powerless speech also has more qualifiers. It tends to say, I think, I believe. It tends to go less for that firm statement of fact and more for softening the blow. It also has long garbled questions and more nervous gestures and fidgeting. If you want some examples of powerless language, phrases that you can avoid are all I, and I won't read all of them, all I know is, I'm sorry, but, kinda, I guess, maybe, perhaps. These are all softeners, powerless language that make you seem less assertive than you actually may be. Conversely, powerful language tends to have fewer hedges. It has a quicker speech rate, a louder voice. There are few to no qualifiers. It's much more direct and to the point. Powerful speech also tends to give orders and take charge. So for example, when speaking to your trial tech, you could say, George, please pull up exhibit five, as opposed to, George, if you don't mind, could you pull up exhibit five? Again, there's nothing to say you can't be polite, saying please is perfectly fine, but it should be a direction, not a question when you're asking someone to do something. 
It has purposeful, forceful gestures as opposed to nervous fidgeting. It really has eye contact. So making sure that you're connecting with jurors through eye contact, that is really a quick way to help build a rapport between you and jurors is to give every juror eye contact. So work your way around the room. Don't just focus on that one juror that really likes you. Powerful speech also demonstrates more personal conviction. Powerful speakers believe what they say and they want you to believe what they say. So the more you have that conviction, the more assertive you seem. And we can see this in the way jurors talk about female attorneys. This juror says that one girl that was there or woman that was there, she hadn't yet go because she was like intense. We were listening to every word she said, but she wasn't ugly about it. She didn't cut off the witness when they were trying to speech. She was just there. She was present, you know, and she never turned her back to us. She always faced us. She was very professional. So here you can see a juror talking about a powerful speaker, an assertive speaker. This female attorney was presenting a very present, intense front, and the juror liked that. Another juror said, so she was really credible and I really liked her discipline. Even though there was some times when the witness got smart with her, she kept her cool and responded to her and was very professional. So again, this juror appreciated that the attorney never let the witness's provocation get to her. Again, sugar, not vinegar. You want to rise above those remarks. That's not to say that you can't be directive with the witness, but Jurors really don't like it when you become combative with the witness. And again, pop culture, this cartoon says, your three o'clock canceled, we're still awaiting the Parson verdict and your husband wants to know if the dishes are dirty or clean. The thing is, jurors know that you're human and everyone has had a day like this cartoon. So juries really appreciate it when you're relatable. Again, in the words of a juror, I'm sure she was mortified when her heel broke and she was left hobbling around the courtroom. She apologized to us, but it actually made her more relatable. It's like, okay, she's human. And it added some levity to a heavy situation. We appreciate that. So again, even when things go wrong, like they have here, her heel broke, that just made her more relatable to jurors. We've all had those days. Jurors don't mind seeing that you're human. It helps them connect with you better. So let's talk about appearance. We talked about how your style needs to change depending on where in the country you are. What are some basic rules for appearance? And many of these suggestions can also apply to male attorneys. This isn't just female attorneys. This one, not so much, but this is, you don't need to dress like a man to be accepted. It's perfectly okay to wear skirts and skirt suits when you are in the courtroom. But it's important to be aware of fashion do's and don'ts. When you're in the courtroom, you wanna to try to limit heel height, avoid very tall spiky heels, avoid flashy colors, you also want to try to limit jewelry. We talked about the cufflinks earlier. Jewelry also is something that you can nervously fidget with. So if you're somebody who's a fidgeter, it's best to limit jewelry regardless. In the end, you're dressing as though you're going to your grandma's church service. You're dressing in a conservative manner. You want to be professional, but you don't want to stand out in a negative way for jurors. All right. Thank you, Katrina. That's a, some good advice, regardless of gender. I think we could all benefit from some of those tips. It uh, looks like we have a couple questions here. The first one is, have there been any studies on the relationship status by gender? Uh, that is, do jurors like or trust women who are married better or worse than they trust unmarried women? Um, I'm not familiar with specific studies on that, but uh, it's that would be something that I would think would also depend on the place of the country you are in. So if you're in a more traditional jurisdiction, being married would be something that I would think jurors would identify more with. If you get to a more liberal jurisdiction, it's probably less of a factor. 
again, we tend to like people who are more similar to us. So people who are in conservative jurisdictions are more likely to be married. So they're more likely to identify with you if you are married. You said it's important to ignore hostile remarks from witnesses. What about when a witness is consistently extremely hostile? If the lawyer doesn't respond to that, do jurors think they're letting themselves be walked all over? There is a point at which a juror will think you're being walked all over. If you are consistently letting the witness direct you and run over the top of you, that is a problem. When I say ignore hostile remarks, that doesn't mean you can't be directive and have them answer your questions. Make sure you keep them on track. However, you don't want to get into a battle of wills with this witness that makes you seem to jurors as though you've sunk to their level and they don't want to see attorneys do that. They want you to rise above those hostile remarks. So directive is fine. You don't wanna let yourself be walked all over, but being overly aggressive tends to be bad in the eyes of jurors. It looks like jurors had varying opinions about politeness. What level of politeness do jurors actually expect? Jurors do expect at least some level of politeness. It's completely okay to say please, it's okay to say thank you, but again, you don't wanna be overly deferential. And I know a lot of this is basically you want to hit the sweet spot, but that really is what we're trying to say here. There is a sweet spot that you want to be in. So you don't want to be too far one way or too far the other. So some politeness is completely fine, but being overly polite and deferential makes jurors think that you're more passive. That makes good sense. Okay, we can go ahead and continue with the webinar. Finally, I wanna talk about why it's so important to have diversity in the courtroom. So we've talked about the fact that gender bias does seem to exist on some level still. So why is it important? Why should you try to combat that rather than just avoiding having diversity? We're gonna talk about four different benefits that diversity has. Number one, effective storytelling. Number two, an ensemble cast of characters. Number three, the contrast effect. And number four, reducing groupthink. In the end, a trial is a story told through the presentation of evidence and arguments. Mastering masses of facts and documents is not enough. If facts and documents alone were enough to persuade people, we really wouldn't have debates at all. People could just state the facts and then we would all move on. That's not enough. Good trial lawyers weave a jumble of evidence into a compelling story that resonates with their audience. And this is important because jurors, human beings as a whole, tend to think in stories, and this can help jurors make sense of the mountains of evidence that they're presented with in court. In fact, a Stanford research study showed that statistics alone have a retention rate of about five to 10%. But when coupled with store, a story or anecdotes, the retention rate rises to 65 to 70%. So simply putting those facts into a story really helps jurors remember what you're talking about. They want to know who the good guys and the bad guys are. They want to know the setting. It really helps them remember what you were talking about. Good trial counsel are able to capture the jury, transport them, and allow them to visualize what happens. You're painting a picture for your jurors. And most litigators are smart people and have the ability to master masses of information. But mastery of facts and documents is very different from mastering the art of storytelling. This is something you have to practice. Knowing and connecting with the audience are the keys to being a successful storyteller in trial. So why is diversity important to this? A homogenous group, that is people who are all the same, homogenous the same, will tend to communicate using tone, cadence, analogies, imagery, and vernacular that are familiar and appealing to members of that group, but perhaps not to others. A good example of this is if you've ever gone out with a friend to meet one of their groups of friends and they all had a bunch of in-jokes and stories they told, you might felt have felt a little left out because you didn't understand their references. The same thing is true in tribe. A trial team with different world and life views allows the team to communicate the client's story in a way that has the most universal appeal. It will help you reach the most people. The thing we're aiming for is the jury identifies with the story, the presentation of that story, and the storyteller. We want jurors to identify with your case, 
how you're telling your case, and you and your client. Again, here we can see why it's so important to have differing characteristics on your trial team from jurors. This juror says, we like that there were several women working on the defense side. This juror says, I feel like the women could relate to her more. And this last juror says, we needed a woman in the mix. Having this ensemble cast of characters is important because as you can see here, people relate to differing characteristics. So benefit number two is having an ensemble cast of characters. We all like to re root for the home team. And as part of that, we like to root for people who are like us. So when assembling a trial team, providing the jury with people who jurors consciously or subconsciously want to see when can help them better identify with you and subsequently your case. Think about the most successful movies and television shows you've seen. The Golden Girls, Avengers, Friends, Community, and Orange is the New Black. All of these had varied casts with different characteristics that people can identify. There's someone there for everyone to sort of latch onto and feel as though they relate to. However, it's critical that the jury see all the trial team members as stars actively presenting the client's case rather than as bit players or extra. And we can see that in what this next juror has to say. They only had her there to be the token black woman because there were black women on the jury. All she did was talk to the wife. It was offensive, like they were pandering to the jury. So for this juror, she uh, looked at the diversity, but she said, yes, you have a black woman there, but you're not asking her to actually do something important. So it's important to make sure that everybody you're including on the trial team is seen, is seen as part of the group. Remember, every member of the Avengers did something. Every member of your trial team should do something. Benefit number three of having diversity in the courtroom is that it helps reduce his group thing. Groupthink is a psychological phenomenon where members of a group seek concurrence for the sake of promoting harmony and reducing conflict within the group. So much so that they actually wind up making poor or irrational decisions. The problem with groupthink is it leads to a lack of critical evaluation of alternative viewpoints because members of the group actively suppress dissenting or minority viewpoints. So again, the group begins to act in lockstep and doesn't consider alternative viewpoints. This is a problem if you're all part of the same group because you're not considering how what you're talking about might relate to other group members. Groupthink tends to be more common in homogenous or non-diverse groups. Heterogeneous groups have differing points of view and knowledge. They consider a more comprehensive set of solutions and debate each other's viewpoints more vigorously leading to higher quality decisions. Diversity of group, me group members is one of the effective anecdotes to group think. Having more points of view allows you to consider the case and the jurors from more angles. Benefit number four is the contrast effect. What is the contrast effect? Women attorneys and attorneys of color may exceed jurors' performance expectations quite easily, especially if jurors stereotypes hold them to low expectations. So if a juror has low expectations about a woman attorney's technical competence and she impresses the panel by mastering that information, she may actually receive more positive evaluations than a male who is presumed to be technically competent. It's sort of because they had such low expectations, they're more likely to give even more credit to somebody who exceeds those. So the contrast effect, having more members on a team, can be positive even if the jurors start out with low expectations. This is why it's so important to be prepared for your presentations because you want to exceed what they think you're going to do. And what can the contrast effect do? So what does the research say about diverse juries? Well, diverse juries promote rigorous debate. This encourages all jurors to examine the facts and evidence of the case more carefully than they would. 
Racially diverse juries deliberated longer, discussed more trial evidence, and made fewer factually inaccurate statements. When discussing the evidence, then did all white juries. So again, having that diversity prompted jurors to have more discussion about the argument itself. Juries that thoroughly discussed each element of a claim were less likely to find the defendant liable or award punitive damages. So again, we can see this impact on the outcome of trials. If you have a more racially or uh, gender diverse jury, they're more likely to deliberate more. And if they deliberate more, they're less likely to find the defendant liable or award punitive damages. So this has a trickle down effect all the way through the trial. Another study, looked at does female representation in a top management improve firm performance? This was a panel investigation. The key takeaways from this panel investigation were that diversity in senior management of top companies in the S&P 500 resulted in an increase of 42 million in the value of those companies. Diverse groups were also higher performing, more creative, and more innovative. Investors are increasingly focused on diversity as a driver of value. They can see what diversity brings to the table and they want to invest in companies that actually have this diversity so that they can increase their Another study, Racial Diversity, Business Strategy and Firm Performance, a resource-based review. This study examined quarterly reporting to the Federal Reserve and HR surveys from 63 firms. The key takeaways here were cultural diversity adds value and contributes to firm competitive advantage when the firm is engaged in a growth strategy. It also showed that firms with diverse management were more creative and innovative. So as you can see, not only does diversity have many benefits, but it is also something large companies and firms are actively seeking to cultivate. A trial team, which must take make strategic decisions and connect well with their audience, it's not all that different from a management team. These research studies only further demonstrate the value that females and minority attorneys can bring to the courtroom. Yes, looks like we have a couple questions here. You talked about diversity being important to jurors. What about judges? Do judges care about diversity in the trial team? Uh, so obviously a judge, if you're looking to have that ensemble cast with someone they will identify with, you don't need the whole ensemble cast. But having a diverse trial team is still important because it allows the trial team to examine it from every angle. This makes your case more solid because you've taken into account more points of view. So regardless of the fact that the ensemble team is not as important here when it comes to finding somebody the judge will identify with, it's still important for how you construct your case. You also said it's important to have uh, people that jurors will identify with. But since we won't know the actual makeup of the jury until voir dire, how do we plan for that? It's generally best to try to be as diverse as possible, regardless of what you're expecting the jury to be. Also, you can look at the jurisdiction overall. What's the makeup? What's the most likely makeup of your jury? What have past juries had on their panels? Who are you looking to get onto your panel? So who's your best panel? Who's your worst panel? Where do you wanna to try to aim that diversity for? So you can kind of speculate and figure out what you think the jury is gonna be like and then aim for that. But having diversity overall is still important. Great, this is all very helpful. Well, if you have any other additional questions or if you need the slides to submit for CLE credit, please reach out to us after the program. We'd be happy to provide that to you. Thanks again. Look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you, everyone.